On 7th January, the Luzon invasion convoy can be seen below as B-24s of the Moratai-based 307th Bomber Group Rendezvous and then head for a strike on Nielsen Field just south of Manila. Operations meet heavy flak, but no enemy plane interception. Nichols Field, also south of Manila. and Nichols Fields are left bomb pitted and burning. On 20th December, Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten arrives at Buthadong, Burma to inspect a task force. The unit is preparing to move against Akiab Island, important seaport city and key anchor of the Burma Front. Allied strategy calls for cutting directly across river valleys. Sampans used for crossing waterways are trucked from river to river. Preparations are made for crossing the Kalapanzan River, next to last waterway lying on the path to Akiab. The final crossing will be over the bay to the island on which Akiab is situated. The island of Akiab was occupied by the Japanese in May 1942. It was immediately made a big naval and air base and bombing attacks were initiated against Calcutta. In December 1943, Field Marshal Wavell sent a force of Indian troops toward Akiab in the hope of retaking it. But the drive bogged down, and Wavell's men were forced to retreat. Recapture of Akiab would give the Allies seven airfields capable of handling bombers, and a port which can handle ships up to 8,000 tons. Beyond the Kalapanzan River, the advance continues along the India Road. At Fowl Point on the Mayu River, troops assemble in invasion craft for landing on Akiab. The island lies four miles across the bay in the broad mouth of the river. Burmese villagers on the island had informed Indian Air Force pilots by a signal system that the Japanese had withdrawn. A reconnaissance party confirmed the information. But troop transports move in ready for action in case of a trap. Forces are reported to be the largest combined operation unit ever established in Southeast Asia. Landing is made without a single shot being fired. The only opposition encountered is in the form of numerous booby traps and mines left by the Japanese. Capture of the island means an important forward base for future operations against the Japanese in Lower Burma. The troops assemble and move toward Akiab, a city of 40,000 prior to hostilities. The three Allied columns still fail to encounter opposition as they travel inland. Closing in on the city, the troops find it completely abandoned by the Japanese. Even the inevitable sniper is missing. But booby traps and mines make search of the jungle city a difficult task. A single Jap is the only captive taken. Apparently a straggler, he was picked up on the march toward the city. Seizure of Akiab will free several divisions of Allied troops for the push on Rangoon for it will permit the British to defend the whole area west of the Burma coastal range with small forces. As soon as the occupation of the island is complete, British officers call a meeting of native chiefs and give them instruction and regulations necessary for military security. To the northeast, in the hills of central Burma, clearing the way through to China, are American troops of the Mars Task Force. Under Brigadier General John S. Willey, they are closing in on enemy forces less than 20 miles below Namcom. Alito Burma Road Juncture.
patrol dashes out of the brush after being pinned down by machine gun fire. The wounded man is a lieutenant who led the patrol which infiltrated the enemy lines to locate the firing position. Japs killed by the 3rd Battalion in the Nam Mo Valley, just west of the Burma Road. Meanwhile, Chinese troops are neutralizing remaining strongholds, barring Allied use of the Lida Burma route into Yunnan province. The movement shown in these films is before the town of Namkam. The 88th Regiment, 30th Division, negotiates the Shueli River on bamboo rafts. Several crossings are made without detection. On 15 January, Namkam is occupied by the 30th Division. Troops inspect a Burmese temple, largest in the area. A native reads an OWI leaflet dropped by the 10th Air Force. It mentions the Mars Task Force. The fall of Namkam is followed by seizure of Wan Ding and Mu Zhe, removing last obstacles to the overland supply route to China. At Lido in Assam, India, ceremonies are held incident to the departure of the first truck convoy over the road through Burma and into China. Lieutenant General Daniel I. Sultan arrives to give official recognition to the opening of the Lido Road by Brigadier General Lewis A. Pick. General Sultan, the Lido Road's open. We have a convoy form. I'd like your permission to take it through to China. Pick, I commend you and the officers and men who have worked with you and for you on a tremendous engineering achievement. This Lido Road is truly a new lifeline to China. The equipment and supplies which you are taking over will be most welcomed by our allies. We expect many more such convoys to follow. Thank you, sir. On your way. Thank Good you. luck and God bless you. Wind them up, Mullet. Yes, sir. General Pick rides in the lead jeep. He assumed command of Lido construction on 13 October 1943. During 10 months prior to that date, only 42 miles of road had been constructed. General Pick began his engineering operation with these words. The Lido road is going to be built. Mud and rain and malaria be damned. On 12 January 1945, trucks loaded with war supplies negotiate the all-weather road from Lido to Michinaw including a two-mile board section elevated on piling. The run to Michinaw is 262 miles. Another 200-odd miles bring the road to Bamo and Mong Yu, where it connects with the old Burma Road. White and Negro engineering detachments, with the latter predominating in numbers, push through jungles, monsoon floods, and range after range of mountains to finish the project. The 566-mile Burma Road winding across the mountains to Gunming had been sealed tight since April 1942. It was virtually reconstructed while Allied forces were routing the Japanese from the area. Today, the combined Lido-Burma highways are known as the Stillwell Road. Corsairs of Marine fighting squadrons are ferried to a carrier for temporary duty in Western Pacific operations, prelude to the first landing on Luzon. These Navy films show the planes being hoisted to the hangar deck, 25th December. Pilots and technicians accompany the planes. They are believed to be the first Marine units to operate from a carrier of this type. 
to the flight deck, and then through Pacific waters with the rest of Vice Admiral John S. McCain's fast carrier task force of the Third Fleet to be launched on the southeastern rim of the China Sea. Japanese inner defense line. Kagi and Eiko airstrips are bombed 3rd and 4th January. It was from some of Formosa's 25 airfields, including eight fields of major size, that the first Jap attacks on the Philippines were launched. Planes returned to their carriers. Simultaneous with the Formosa operations was a strike against Okinawa in the Ryukyus by elements of the same fleet. In addition to a number of ships sunk and damaged, 111 planes were destroyed, 220 damaged. Damage was also done to ground installations. Takeoffs and landings represent a few incidents chosen from the long pictorial record of normal operations. Our losses on this carrier sweep, 34 aircraft, 17 of which were lost in combat. The difficulties of the Italian campaign are increased by severe winter weather which blankets the rough mountainous terrain with snow. Armored vehicles move cautiously forward over icy roads. After the first heavy snowfall of winter, these tanks of the 13th Corps were delayed three days trying to reach their destination over virtually impassable roads. When the snow-packed roads became icy, tank treads slipped and the vehicles slid into muddy ditches. Road movement proving too slow and hazardous, the tanks were driven cross-country safely to their destination. Idice River Valley. Heavy enemy shelling over this area has made it extremely difficult to set up gun emplacements. A field artillery battalion solves the problem. Concealed under what appears to be an ordinary pyramidal tent is a 105 millimeter howitzer and ammunition. The gun fires through the tent opening. During bad weather, the tents also serve as shelter for both men and guns. New snowshoes are issued to units in the snow blanketed 4th Corps sector, 5th Army Front. A unit moves up the snow covered road toward the jump off point for patrol action. 
The patrol puts on snowshoes before starting off into the deep snow. The patrol can now move easily up the trail and out into the open country, unimpeded by the heaped up drifts. Snow and freezing temperatures in the Apennines make the going tougher than usual for the men handling vehicles along Highway 65. Men in trucks have some protection, but Jeep drivers have to use their wits to keep out of the wind, rain, and snow. By salvaging and taking advantage of scrap materials, many of them have constructed ingenious coverings. The canvas being used to cover this rod frame was salvaged from a shelter half. Scrap wood was saved up to make a frame for a completely enclosed body job. The top is salvaged canvas, stretched tight and nailed to the frame. Pressed wood makes a very neat rear. Even windows of plexiglass salvaged from wrecked aeroplanes can be put in. Utility as well as protection, a door that can easily be taken off when the windshield must be let down in areas a mile or two from the front. The novel feature about this neat design is that the top has been made so it can be removed in one piece. The news spreads. The driver of a smooth job made entirely out of scrap materials shows a GI still freezing out in the cold what can be done. This vehicle could very easily pass for a station wagon, but it's just another Jeep. The driver designed it so it would have a maximum of window space. Here's a prime example of GI ingenuity. Homemade windows with no draft ventilation. The unusual appearance made by this Jeep is due to the windows on the doors. They are made of two plexiglass blisters salvaged from a wrecked airplane. The dome makes backing up easy. A clever slide arrangement allows the driver to show his trip ticket without opening the door. While terrain and weather keep the Italian front fairly static, transforming Jeeps is just one example of GI ingenuity in improving living conditions. on the Western Front during the final stages of the Battle of the Bulge. Roads radiating out of Eupen, Belgium, and southward toward Malmedy and Stavelo are blanketed by four to five feet of snow. Shovel brigades strive to keep a lane clear, but high winds pile up new drifts. Tied up behind these snow removal forces are convoys stretching for three solid miles trucks loaded with ammunition, mail and food, and ambulances with litter cases from the front lines. Troops improvise protective covering, but weather casualties have been severe. As the blizzard lifts, a snowplow works along the highway. These adverse conditions consistently hampered operations flattening the bulge. The Belgian town of Sterpigny is shelled by the 3rd Armored Division. Sterpigny is 11 miles below Saint-Vite, last major enemy held road junction. Several American soldiers are thrown from their truck by a shell burst. The driver is unhurt and rushes off to get first aid for the injured. A jeep brings in the medical crew. Near Falise, 17 January. A Mark VI tank camouflaged by the Nazis to resemble a U.S. M-10 tank destroyer. Complete with our white stars and divisional markings, it was knocked out when it tried to penetrate the American lines. The disguised tank is removed by the 462nd Ordnance Evacuation Company, operating in the 30th Division sector. Quartermaster operations as shipments reach a communication zone headquarters supplying the Western Front. From trains and trucks, the stocks are unloaded onto conveyors and move down to the sorting and supply area. 
The entire layout is arranged so as to shortcut the process of segregating the variety of foodstuffs and other stores prior to their delivery to troops. Detoured off the main conveyor belt by sorting crews, these boxes are stacked with others containing their particular type of provisions. Increasing quantities of supplies freshly arrived from coastal ports are moved up in pace with accelerated activities all along the Rohr River, Luxembourg, and Alsace fronts. Collecting bed sheets from civilian homes in Stolberg, Germany, east of Aachen, to supplement our issue of cloth for snowsuits. American troops, aided by civilian authorities, gather the sheets on a house-to-house -house tour. The collection is carried through in orderly fashion. Some opposition had been expected, but those responsible for gathering the sheets report that no resentment was apparent among the housewives of the German town. Shower time for Battle Begrime GI, southwest of Saarbrück in Germany. A pump siphons water from a stream on the Third Army front, while a diesel engine gives the water a temperature of 104 degrees, heating 32 gallons a minute. Clean clothes go with every GI scrub down, so sound off on your size. Socks, drawers, underwear, all of these and hot water are furnished by a fumigating and bath company. Added cold weather comfort, a heated dressing tent, the bathing unit services around 2,000 men a day. Not only is this service a relief to men who haven't cleaned up in weeks, but also when men are headed for battle, showers help lessen the danger of infection from wounds. To the shower tent, a hotel luxury to GIs who have been using an empty gasoline can with holes in the bottom. Allotted time for each man, eight minutes. Back to the dressing tent, clean and refreshed. Quartermaster has duplicated scenes like these on every American battlefront. Dirty clothes go to the laundry, another item that keeps men of the fumigating and bath company busy 13 hours a day. B-17s of the 8th Air Force. Target, Berlin. Heavy flak greets the flying fortresses as they approach the city for this year-end attack on the Nazi capital. labels Berlin as the most heavily bombed target in Europe. The British Air Ministry reports that the total weight of explosives dropped on Berlin and its suburbs since the beginning of the war is about 62,000 tons. Air Force's films, blockbusters are visible scoring hits within the target area. 